Sometimes our dinner conversations were on subjects that demanded the deepest possible thought, and sometimes the subjects were met with a science fiction type approach that bordered on tall dreaming about a world that was still being built. At times it was also centered on actual dreams. Caracas had been a wonderful place for dreaming. I don't know whether this dreaming was caused by the thin mountain air, or the fact that our hotel was often surrounded by clouds during the night, or whether it was due to the total quietness of sleeping high above the city on a mountain ridge, cradled on scientifically advanced mattresses, as the hotel boasted in its advertisements. Often, elaborate fantasies emerged in my dreams, sometimes with a clarity that was more forceful than a movie or a stage play. The majority of my dreams, of course, were directly connected with the conference, and some were centered on Antonovna. One of the most extraordinary of these dreams had all the trimmings of an oriental mythology. I found myself in a mansion. I was alone. The rooms were brightly lit, but they were empty. I walked from room to room in a day's bewilderment, searching for someone or a way out. The rooms were large, elegant, endlessly interconnected, furnished in the finest tradition of a bygone age. The place was deadly silent, except for my footsteps on the carpets. On the ground floor of the mansion was a solarium. The solarium was much more grandiose than that of our hotel. The solarium in my dream had a courtyard at its center, with a fountain. From there, the wide marble walkway led to a door that opened to a garden. The garden was like a miniature park, filled with a profusion of flowering tropical plants, flooded with sunlight. A sweet odor of blossoms filled the air. The courtyard of the solarium was laid out in geometric patterns, composed of various shades of marble. I noticed a grouping of garden furniture in the middle of the courtyard that matched the color of the surrounding blossoms and blended with the white marble platform on which it stood. That's when I became aware of a girl on a recliner, sunning herself. Actually she noticed me first. I'm your cousin Veronica, she introduced herself. She spoke in a friendly, carefree manner, and with a most wonderful smile. She hadn't expected me she had been sun tanning in the nude. Hastily she dressed. She had the most perfect figure, like a Greek goddess, gently pointed breasts, erect nipples, all of which she hurried to hide. Come with me, she asked, and with the same smile as before, she reached out her hand. She opened a pair of brass doors at the end of a narrow walkway that led to a different garden than the one I had seen before. This one was a wide open garden from where we had a view across the world. Our mansion was built on a high hill. It seemed as though the whole earth lay before us. Come. She urged me, I will show you the temple. I followed without a comment. At the edge of the garden stood a white marble structure. It featured a domed marble roof, supported by four pillars, which together formed four gates. I marveled at the exquisite appearance of the structure. I stepped inside. Come, I gently urged her, please follow me. No. I can't follow you. In life's temple one is always alone. In truth there is no separation, we are at one with the whole of humanity. No one exists in isolation, but this must be learned, she said. I urged her again, to come. She shook her head. As individuals we are alone with ourselves. We must be alone. This is the mark of our autonomy. Then I don't want to be in this temple, I replied. I want to be with you. The moment I had spoken, I realized that the gates were suddenly closed. You can't escape life, she said. I noticed that the gates led to the north, south, east, and west. The garden of life was much larger now. At its center stood the greatest temple to love ever built, the great Taj Mahal. But I couldn't reach it. I was imprisoned in my own temple. I tried every gate. Every single gate was firmly closed. The four gates lead to four rivers, Veronica said. What good are the rivers if the gates won't open? I asked. Veronica had stopped answering now. She had turned and was walking back to the mansion. I cried, but when I came to the gate to the north, it opened, and immediately I was on a river. Its name was Bison. 
the name had been inscribed into the gate. I suddenly found myself in a boat that moved silently against the flow of the river. The boat looked like a discarded river patrol vessel from the Vietnam War. Indeed, this type of boat was totally appropriate for the country that I crossed which had the appearance of being a most inhospitable place. Its shores were dark, eerie, cold. The echo of dying birds vibrated through the forest. There was no laughter, no human voice, no sunshine, no life. Oh how I longed for Veronica, in this desert of desolation. Her presence would have felt so rich, her love so exciting, her warmth so beautiful. The forest has a strange name I heard a voice say within. It is the forest of the marriage of human beings, the murderer of its brothers, the Adam dream of a woman taken from man. At one point far down the river I came upon a massive iron draw gate that blocked my way. The structure was linked to a gatehouse built on a rock on shore. The draw gate had a sign on its beam, like a giant bumper sticker. The love of the good and beautiful, and their immortality, was written on the sign. A gatekeeper came out of the gatehouse to the side of the river, and welcomed me he looked at me with a deeply insightful look, and shook his head. He seemed disappointed. He had a pen in his hand, to enter my name in a ledger, that he carried. He thumbed through the pages. He opened another section, divided by index markers, and thumbed through the pages again. Eventually he shook his head, and closed the book of the ledger. This river leads into the great unknown, that is unknown to you, he explained. I cannot let you pass. According to law, the land beyond is accessible only to much more complete individuals. You are not qualified. It is too dangerous for people who are empty inside to enter this land, people such as you, with hearts choked up with too much knowledge, that is but false wisdom, who embrace deadly illusions. You would be tempted to kill the inhabitants of the land since you don't know what is good and beautiful and enduring. Turn back. Turn back. If I let you pass you will not be able to survive the active defenses of the people of the land beyond who must protect what is most precious which has been entrusted into their stewardship for endless development. Turn back my friend. Turn back. You don't belong there, not yet, anyway. I nodded reluctantly, but before turning back, I gained a glimpse of the inhabitants of this land, men, women, not walking in pairs. I saw in their gestures their universal embrace of each other, their heads raised up with the pride of a divinely royal person, their eyes radiating with a satisfaction that I had rarely seen, their smiles telling of a deep inner peace. I longed to be with them. I was certain that I saw Veronica there. Turn back. The gatekeeper demanded for the third time. I knew deep in my heart that I had no choice but to comply. Crashing the gate wasn't an option. If I did, I felt I would be expelled by a higher power whose force I wouldn't be able to resist. As I turned to go back, sadly, despondent over my inadequacy, I found myself in the temple again, bewildered and puzzled by what I had seen. I was alone once more as before. All the gates were still closed around me I looked towards the east, and, as I did, the thought of the east frightened me now. I saw in my mind the image of the cradle of Jesus, the dawning of the Christ idea, the spiritual idea of God. I saw in it an immense challenge, facing the power of God, and its imperatives. What if I came to stand in the way of this power? The way marker for the gate said, that the gate leads into the land of human freedom, the freedom rooted in the highest idea of good, the universal welfare of mankind, socially, civilly, and morally. I shook my head in frustration. The challenge seemed too large. Indeed, the challenge made no sense, suddenly. Am I my brother's keeper? I said to myself, as I hesitated. Do you want to travel the river? I heard a voice within. The name of the river is Gihon. Uncertain, I took hold of the gate, and immediately I found myself in a barge that was adorned like a pleasure boat, filled with laughter and music. Fine wine was served. But the shoulders of the river were scenes of chaos, lined with walls of smoke. The smell of burning flesh was in the air. 
This time there were human voices heard from the land, but they were cries of agony, slavery, hunger, war, oppression, and violence. I shook my head again. I said, I don't want to be here. A voice spoke from within, this is the scene that mankind lives in it is its home, its treasury, the center and circumference of its being in a small life. Does mankind see nothing else? I asked. Does it know nothing else? Is there nothing brighter that has an impact on its life and its world? Are its eyes blinded by the fire of its rage and its ears deafened by the thunder of its tumults and the choruses of crying? The voice didn't answer me perhaps it had no answer for what I saw. As before, far down the river I came upon a draw gate strung across the water. Its inscription, to my great surprise, read, The rights of woman acknowledged morally, civilly, and socially. As I approached the gate, the keeper of the gate came out and welcomed me. I asked him, What is the meaning of woman? It signifies mankind's humanity, the highest form of man, he said, but I cannot let you pass, he explained. I can tell by your question that you are too blind for this land. You can't see your own humanity. This land is too demanding. The baggage that you carry will break your heart. Turn back. Also, you would be too dangerous for the people of the land beyond, whose culture you would not understand, and would attempt to damage like an elephant in a china shop. The gatekeeper began to laugh. He opened his ledger and entered my name, as if it were for a traffic citation. The law of this land states that only complete individuals may pass beyond this point. I perceive that you are not fully alive. Your name isn't registered in the Book of the Living. You are registered as one who is dead in mindless obedience and subservience to myths. The land beyond is too complex for you, it would destroy you, and you would be causing damage to it. Therefore you cannot pass. Turn back. Obediently, I nodded. But before turning back I observed the inhabitants of the land. They were like people who had shed their chains, but not through tribulation. They had their ears and eyes open to the bounty of their own creating. It was like a land of kings and priests, to a higher image of humanity, than I had ever seen. They were clothed with the sun, and had on their head a crown, that was a ring of stars. Nor were they any longer divided by sex. They appeared, as if they rejoiced, and for good reason, celebrating in their sparkling bright humanity. The people I saw there appeared to have been exalted by their embrace of reality I had never seen. This time I did see Veronica among them, but too far for me to reach. Turn back. The gatekeeper demanded for the third time. I drew away from the gate, and, as before, immediately, I found myself back in the temple. But the temple looked different now. It had all the appearance of a church that was also an institution for trials and healing and education. No idleness here. Read a tablet on one its pillars. However, the four gates still remained. I looked at the gate to the north. I shied away from it. Likewise I shied away from the gate to the east. Also their color didn't match the color of the church, as if they belonged to a different world, the world of the temple. I looked towards the south, now. The color of its gate matched the color of the church. A feeling of serenity came over me I thought of the warmth of a tropical paradise. I could see the southern star, in my mind, traversing a sunlit sky. The name of the river that the gate of the south has inscribed into it, was it equal? Eagerly I touched the gate. As I did, I suddenly remembered that the genial tropics were overlaid with the image of the cross, the cross of Calvary the cross that binds all humanity into solemn union. The river took me through a land of cathedrals, gallows, and high priestly thrones littered with swords. What am I doing here? I said to myself, as there was no one with me that's not a tropical paradise, I protested, but there was no one to speak to who would hear my protests. I traveled upstream again. I traveled in a stately royal barge, decorated with flowers, I also saw great tablets of stone erected on the shore, some cut of white marble with holy inscriptions that should remain for all ages. But the golden lettering had faded. Only the blood beneath them was still fresh. And there were other tablets, 
tablets of alabaster that carried the inscriptions of all the abominations of history. The images with the inscriptions had become blurred through the years. One was of the whore of Babylon riding her scarlet-colored beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And at her feet, the kings that worshipped her, who had no kingdom of their own, but received power as kings with the beast from her, and beside her, were the merchants, who had waxed rich by the abundance of her, delicacies. No. I cried. I don't want to be here. But the barge went on and I remained in it. There were still other tablets of stone that I saw. Some were still under construction. A lone workman carved the title of one, the thousand-year anniversary of the Christianization of Russia. It read. Beneath it was the scene of an orgy of prostitution. Next went by a huge tablet of black granite. It carried no picture, only an inscription in gigantic letters carved very deep into the stone and filled with no coloring. Except the shine of black pitch, IMF equals death, it read. Behind the tablet lay the ruins of ancient temples, and the ruins of cities of featureless glass towers surrounded by barbed wire fences, that had kept humanity in. Emotionally exhausted I came to the draw gate, almost relieved, as it promised the journey's end, according to my previous experiences. However, I was puzzled by the inscription on the draw gate. It read, Divine Science Understood and Acknowledged. We are the light of creation. I reasoned with myself. We are also the IMF, said a voice within. We have created death. We must go backwards over our nakedness, and rebuild the image of man, as the image of the creator of the universe, in which we live. We must educate the whole of humanity with the truth, and heal it. The image of our fellow man is our own. We must acknowledge, that which is true. This is love. The gatekeeper interrupted my thoughts. There is a law in this land that only more complete individuals make pass. I raised my hand to stop him and said that I knew all of this already. I cannot let you pass, turn back. He said in a serious tone of voice, as if a teacher had failed a child in school for its own good. I cannot let you pass, because you cannot hear the language of the people in the land beyond. Without knowing the language, you cannot hear the truth nor discern the path on which you are going. Return to the temple. If I let you pass, you would become hopelessly lost. Also you would cause great damage to the land beyond as a fumbling moron. Turn back. I replied that I would go back. Nevertheless I stalled him long enough to observe the people of the land behind the draw gate. They were a strange people, as of one mind, in a dialogue with each other, and with themselves, dialogues bright with honesty, in which lies had no place to exist. The people were working, as a team, but no one was leading them. No dictator stood before them to conduct their affairs. They were enlarging their tents freely. They had swung their doors open wide. They called their tents a church, a laboratory for a living and its purpose was to break the taboos of the shadows of the past. I looked at the gatekeeper and shook my head. I cannot let you pass, the gatekeeper repeated. You have a vision, but your vision is incomplete. This land destroys philosophers who do not wish to think, who prostitute themselves into other people's service, as most philosophers do, who babble out what their masters demand, and then make the people treasure that poison that is designed to kill them. That's the face of people who are empty inside. Be kind to yourself, turn back. Don't crash through the gate, no matter how tempting this may seem. The damage you would cause would hang, like a millstone around your neck forever, and would eventually drown you. We gatekeepers are the protectors of civilization. Without protection the brightest renaissance is doomed to be destroyed, as this happens so often. I was surprised that this time the gatekeeper had come out of his gatehouse to meet me without his book of the ledgers in hand. I rejected his demand to turn back. I will not turn back until you answer one question that makes my coming here worthwhile. I said to him. The gatekeeper smiled. Congratulations my friend, ask away. If I was to turn back, how would I ever know when I have gained completeness? How can I be complete in something 
that cannot be defined. How can I know that I am complete? I asked these things in exasperation. That's easy, the gatekeeper replied and continued smiling. You will know that you are not empty of the truth when your life becomes empty of what it is not. Ponder about what you saw. Where the image is true. Or where they but images that you have accepted. I turned away from him, disappointed and sad, and apparently not any wiser. Why did he speak in riddles? I was intrigued, though, by the people that I saw behind the draw gate, and by what the gatekeeper had said that I could not understand. As I turned back, I found myself in the church again. Bewildered, as at all times before, I faced the next gate, the gate to the west, the last of the four gates. The gate led to the golden shore of love, and the peaceful sea of harmony, said its inscription. The river that it was leading to was called Euphrates, and beneath the title was a mile-long description that said something about a new kind of science, called divine science, the science of our divinity, that can take us beyond our limitations, even while we seem to be bound to them. I was puzzled. I looked towards the west, but I saw nothing but the empty sky and the sun overhead. I also realized that the west is where the sun sets. Is this the golden shore of love, where our love is mirrored in the golden glow of the sunset, that heralds the promise of a new day? Is the golden glow a metaphor for the gold that we find when we have lifted ourselves above the fog of earthbound living? In this regard, I saw the sunset not so much as a portal to the darkness of a night, but as a portal to the peace of a well-earned step of achievement. I found myself pondering if I was ready to pass through that final gate for that final journey. Was I ready to face the struggles and agonies along the river? Would I be rejected again and be turned back? Was I still that empty inside to be stopped, as before, by the keeper of the draw gate? Was I full of what is not? I paused and looked back across my entire life and examined critically what I had stood for. Was it all emptiness? I answered without hesitation that it was not. In that moment I touched the gate to the west. Its river flowed through a stormy land. The shores were steep vineyards, some giving way to towering cliffs with shrines and churches on them, and places marked with crosses and gravestones. I was on a sightseeing boat. The tourists were laughing, eager to learn, attentive to their guide, who told them what to look for, what the sights represented, and how they should feel about this country. I'm disappointed, I said to a man next to me I expected something profound, like on the three previous rivers. The tour guide is lying, said the man. He whispered to me the churches and temples are the edifices of cults. The man said, this, and nodded, as if he had been there. I believed him. His face had the scars of deep sorrows. Cultism is the most hidden and deep-cutting wickedness on earth. It is the church of poverty, he said. Communism is a cult, and the West is full of cults of greed, and sex, and power. Their dimension are inhuman, stark coldness and cruelty. There is not a trace of anything human in them. Their halls are the halls of fascism. I protested, but then I cried, because I knew the man had dared to open his eyes, and had seen what I had also seen, an emptiness surrounded by affinity that contained the sword of violence. It was a scene that we were trained not to look at however I had also seen beyond that facade. No. The West is not made up entirely of cults, I answered the man. The West has been built on science and understanding. On universal principles, on breaking down limits and finity, and improving the status of man. Look at the coldness of the temples, the man replied, as if it was his mission to convince me look at the blood-stained palaces of their bow rooms at the top floors of the glass towers beside the graves of the unemployed workers, who were discarded the moment they were no longer a resource, but a liability. And also look at the coldness of the prisons, and the coldness of the country's secrecy. This is not human, I replied. This is not love. The man laughed. What is love? He said. Yes, there is love the kind that this madness cannot conceal, I said to him. The tour guide is a fraud. A blind man, 
leading the blind. This whole river journey is false. The man looked at me and then smiled. The river is what you see, he said. The more you open your eyes and then your mind, the more beautiful the images become. Science is the gateway to the truth. Science is the Christ. This river is your journey in the land of progressive science. It lets you see what no eye can see, if you are willing. I lifted my gaze up to the steep hill's eyes again, and cried. I cried for the pains of humanity, pains that had no reason for being. Suddenly, the temples and churches were no longer monuments of coldness, but had become palaces of infinity, representing the truth and the power of understanding. They had become palaces of universal knowledge, universities, churches. At this moment I noticed a fork in the river that I had not seen before. A narrow branch flowed out of a gorge that led deep into the mountains. It led between rock-ribbed walls that echoed the call of wild cranes. I shouted to the captain, change course. Follow this path. I pointed to the branch of the river that flowed out of the mountains and pointed out that it flowed smoothly, indicating a deep draft, while the river ahead was white with shallow waters. The captain took note, but said, no, he said, that the tourist director was in charge and had commanded him to go straight on. I am the director of myself, I can't swim, I replied to the captain. I replied cautiously. At first I replied only to myself, then I began shouting my reply strongly to the captain, and immediately I jumped into the water. Everyone on the boat shouted, come back, you can't do that. Hey, I just did, I shouted back, and started to swim towards the canyon. I swam the entire length of the canyon, effortlessly overcoming the flow of its slow-moving current. In fact, I found the swimming invigorating. When the river widened behind the gorge, it opened up and became wider, and flowed gently into a valley. Far at the end of the valley I saw the familiar draw gate again. This time its inscription read, Divine Science Encompassing the Universe and Man, Metaphysics Taking the Place of Physics. Let me pass, I called to the gatekeeper as I climbed out of the water. He shook his head. This land has a law, he started to say, holding his hand up to hold me back. I know all that, I interrupted. You must let me pass, because I have earned my way across. I am no longer so empty inside that I do not know myself as a human being. There is no need for you to hold me back. The gatekeeper looked at me, surprised, then nodded in agreement. But you must return to the church and to the temple. Whatever love you find in the land beyond the draw gate shines resplendent only by what you bring to it, within yourself. You require a strong inner light in this land, for the journey is immensely great beyond the gate, and the path is not mapped out for you, he cautioned me. He asked me to read the inscription on the gate. Do you know what divine science is? He said. It is the science of your divinity, as a human being. It is your gate to infinity. You must pass through this gate again, and again, and discover bit by bit your divinity. And this is an endless journey. There is no finity beyond this gate. I said that I promised to return and do, as he had told. See to it that you do, the gatekeeper said. If you don't do this, you will be tempted to climb the great mountain for the majesty of the view that it offers, and you will be tempted to write to all the world of its grandeur. But your work will be empty, if it is not to glow with universal love, and universal sovereignty. It would then be of no use to anyone, but would become a prison. An empty philosophy becomes a prison for humanity. You don't want to become a prison keeper, do you? Then people would call on you, and demand that you teach them your new vision, and you will shackle and snare them with your dreams that have nothing to do with reality, and build a prison for them. You will tell them that there is no truth in anything, because without the divinity of love, truth cannot be recognized. You will cripple them with expectations that you deprive them of the means to grasp. And in the end you will find yourself proud to be pushing them in the wheelchairs of your creating. Unless you understand the science of the divinity of your being, your love for humanity tends to drive you into dangerous quackery, and you will become a babbling fool. 
and so I must ask you to examine yourself if you could stand before a mirror and say with all honesty that the inhabitants of the land would not be harmed by you entering their land. If you can assure this to you, you are free to go on. I paused. I hesitated. I nodded. So go on, he said, but be aware not ever to lose sight of the divinity of love. Its light is your humanity. Go and start climbing every path before you to the last step. Embrace the toil of yours and find the clear path through the steaming jungles that give you access to the high meadows and snow fields from where you are able to scale the tall cliffs, traverse walls of ice. He stopped, suddenly. Go on, I urged him. He said, no you lack one thing, he said. Unless your experience enables your brother to stand where you stand, turn back. By this alone you will know that your living is complete. If you cannot guarantee to yourself that you will do this, no matter what efforts this takes, you must go back to the gate, where you entered the river, the gate at the church. From there you must conquer every one of the other rivers. Each gate that you see there is a science portal that opens a pathway to new realms of truth. You must travel the rivers that are rivers of science, and do this again, and again until the draw gates are no longer a challenge in your path as you can handle them by the power of your own labor and the resulting achievements. Be aware that the land of love is a land of tireless movements wrought with great responsibility towards your fellow man and towards the future of mankind, a responsibility for creating a renaissance without end, the dynamics of which can be learned. I nodded. I said I understood. At least I thought I understood. The gatekeeper smiled. He motioned me to stand beside him. As I did, he instructed me in the mechanics of how to lay a hand onto the hand wheel to raise the gate, which he said I must do for myself. Creaky and rusty, the old iron gate rose. I cranked it up just high enough for me to pass. With my task accomplished, I plunged back into the river to swim on. As I did so, I found myself in a cathedral. An usher approached me and demanded total silence. I looked around. Over the altar of the cathedral hung a series of large paintings. One of them depicted a lone star shining above a dim night of chaos. The next showed Jesus raising a young woman to life. The scene is the miracle that will rescue humanity from its tiny marriages, said a voice echoing in my head, as if someone had spoken and had stirred the great silence. The next painting in line showed a woman writing in a book, and the next one was that of a Christmas party. Among the guests of the party was a woman despondently absent, reclining in a wheelchair, accompanied by another woman. The wheelchair was pushed by a benign gentleman in black, who leaned over them both. Was I that man? He was shown in a caring manner, having one hand on the wheelchair, the other on the shoulder of the woman, who looked longingly into his face. Do you understand the death that results from the care of one who has not grown up towards a greater completeness? The voice from within spoke to me again. Do you understand the deadly dangerous emptiness of the care of a person who seeks to gain his completeness from others? I looked at my marriage with Sylvia as it had been a long time ago. Had I treated Sylvia that way? Heather was there, too. She had been in the wheelchair with her. I had been pushing that wheelchair for a dozen years, but neither of them had been helped by me in any way, because of my incompleteness. I also knew, that this had been a long time ago. All of that had been changed. The following painting depicted a Christmas morning. And the resurrection of woman. I saw a woman clad in white garments, followed by scenes of Christian healing. In which the sick person is a male, and the healer, that same woman a clothed with the sun, so it seemed, who represents our humanity, as the gatekeeper had revealed. And one of the last images showed this woman again in the form of an angel bidding entrance into the house of humanity with her hands on the door knocker that resembled a person who had folded his hands in front so that they would hit the genitals. I was startled by the design of the door knocker. The painting was titled, Truth vs. Error. Do you understand the meaning of the pictures? whispered that voice from within. I nodded. I do understand, I replied. If you do, 
you are ready to go on and to function in democratic association built on the divinity of love, that is your divinity. I closed my eyes, and immediately I was on a river again. But the draw gate past the city of glass towers was open this time. The gatekeeper waved as I swam beyond it, and instantly I found myself in a wide mountain meadow. In front of me stood Anton. She wore a white gown with a golden belt around her waist, and on her feet soft Chinese shoes. I was also aware of yet another person. I looked and saw Sylvia standing beside me. She smiled, but said nothing. We were surrounded by a vast sea of yellow flowers, ringed in the distance by tall blue mountains. We seemed to match this beauty. We were all beautiful to each other. We loved each other's smile and expression. We loved the way we dressed. We loved the way our hair moved in the gentle breeze, and the way we spoke to each other, and the way we thought. Our gestures were inviting and reassuring. There was peace in this world and a feeling in the heart that no sexual elation could equal, though it seemed to be an element of it. This is the sublime, said the voice from within. This moment will change and uplift your life and will uplift humanity with it. You have become free. I reached forward and removed Anton's golden belt and her white dress and looked into her face and smiled. It was radiating with a lovely a smile, a smile that stirred deep feelings in me. I also noticed her breasts, which were the same as those that I had seen in the solarium. I reached out to her. We reached out to each other. We embraced one another. Weakest. I relished her touch, the touch of her body. We held each other tight, and when we let go I felt no loss. What heavenly touch has made you so exceedingly beautiful, Anton? I whispered as we faced each other. Nothing that I have done. I haven't changed, she answered. But you have grown. You have grown rich. You have become more complete. Your embrace includes worlds upon worlds that you hadn't looked at before. By then Sylvia stood afar, waving to me from a distance, in the way that Era had waved to me years ago in Ruggles Lounge. Only the meaning was different this time. At Ruggles the people around us had been like props. We alone had seemed real. Now our waving to each other was as if it included the totality of all being in a giant embrace. Here Sylvia, too, was free, free to stand on her own, free to be at my side, free to stand afar satisfied. We both waved to her, and threw kisses. I called out to her that I loved her. We kept on waving. As she receded from view, and still, she was, as if she had remained with us. The rivers have taken your nakedness from you and given us great riches, in which we can see what we have never seen before, I heard her call out to us, from the distance. Her voice was carried by the wind. In this liberation is bound up the hope of the world, said Anton. It guarantees the survival of Africa, the end of violence, a call to enrich the earth with a new rising of man, even the liberation of Russia, China, and America, from themselves, for themselves, and by themselves. While she spoke, I became aware of another person at my side. I noticed Heather standing beside me. She stood tall, beautiful and proud, clad in her birthday suit. We embraced each other. Then I noticed Sylvia again. She was with us in our embrace, but she was different, somehow. She was like someone who is richly adorned with the gift of love that we had all brought to each other. There will be war no longer, said Anton, with a smile. Here, I heard the voice from within, again speaking to me in the rhythm of a familiar poem that went something like this. Oh, joy and peace. The unknown, though yet to be known. The flitting recovered from distant veil. Fire of the sublime. Oh, love divine. The gold unseen by greed, by toil, by the dead. The eternal overflowing fount. Ruler of the greatest riches. Oh, life, a communication without words. Reclaimed, cut loose. From iron anchors wedged deep in heavy darkness. Daring to be, a sun beneath the rain. Oh, light, the great science, our power. Beyond the dark homes of the living dead. The morning dew from heaven's bounty. That feeds the flower and a world that lives on wings. Oh, the sublime. But what is the sublime?
I heard myself asking. Is it related to the conference? Since I couldn't answer, I woke from my dream, though acknowledging with joy that the sublime was already unfolding in the sublimity of our discoveries of the wonders of love. At breakfast that morning I told everyone about my beautiful and mysterious dream. I told them that I awoke because I remembered the conference. We must all make this journey, said Anton, smiling at me. It sounds too wonderful to miss, don't you agree? I nodded and answered with a kiss. The kiss drew the loveliest smile. Had the rivers been real that I had dreamed about? They reflected in essence something that I realized had always existed between us, but had been blocked by me or was the dream all but a reflection of the research that I had taken up with Ross and to Mary's work, powered by elaborate theories and by discoveries of the dynamics of mankind's infinite soul. You are making this journey too, I replied to Anton, only yours will be different. No one can tell you what you may find in your life. She nodded ever so slightly. These rivers are real, said Ross to Anton. I have discovered the concepts that are involved, together with Pete. These are not easy concepts to come to terms with, but they are profound when one recognizes what they involve. He turned to me the rivers are not lateral structures, as it may seem, he said. They have a high point and a low point. There is always a downflow happening that in its course enriches the landscape. But this is not the essence of science. The rivers represent scientific development. Scientific development doesn't happen when one just floats along with the flow of the river, or worse yet, when one travels the river on a boat. Peter was traveling on a boat on the first three rivers in his dream, and consequently he didn't get past the draw gate. Only when he came to the draw gate swimming, was he recognized as someone who might qualify to pass. And so he was asked further questions. It is the nature of science that one swims against the flow of it not with it. Swimming against the flow of the world, one struggles to get to the source of the outflow of good. This struggle has its reward. The struggling opens the mind to inspirations and discoveries, whereby the benefits are won, and never given, as a gift, such as religions offer and philosophies. Sometimes the breakthroughs in science are wrought with bleeding footsteps. Ah, uh, as in Peter's CSB experience, Anton interjected, Ross nodded. What one gains in the difficult experiences, reaching four aspects of universal principles, becomes one's currency in the latter world, said Ross. It appears to me, Anton, that we all need to travel these rivers again, and again, and swim against the flow of the world towards the truth, as in the CSB experiences indeed, I said to her. It seems we need to be involved at every level of human existence and deal with what we find there and move forward, upstream, and bring light to the world with what we have found and uplift in the process what needs to be uplifted. We must face the depravities, explore the paradoxes, and raise our axioms that have created the paradoxes. Then we can also help those that have dropped into depravity. We've become a healing force then. We also need to be involved in the moral domain, I continued. We need to embrace the good that we find there, that we find in our humanity, and embrace what is good, even slightly, and drag it up with us as we seek higher ground, where we can cherish it more, and honor one another more. Then we live the principle of sovereignty. When we struggle to move forwards it becomes impossible for us to slide backwards into depravity. In the rivers of science we swim against the flow, because we swim towards the source, the truth. The truth is our intellectual and spiritual gravity. If we don't swim against the flow of the gravity of the earth, the gravitational pull of the earth will carry us backwards. That's what I have learned from my dream. In addition, we also need to explore each scientific element that we find in our journey in each and every river. We need to utilize these as tiny portals to reality that the process of science provides in so many ways. By developing our scientific understanding of the universal principles of the universe, we give ourselves far greater freedoms than we ever had before. We also need to dwell in the land beyond the gate that scientific understanding gives us access to, I continued.
that's the land of the great universal good that all the great thinkers throughout history have associated with human freedom, boundless capabilities, with love, life, truth, even God. Isn't it interesting, and on, that God and good are both linked to the same word in English, with just a small difference in spelling? Maybe it is that small difference that we need to erase. Maybe this is what the rivers are all about, said Ross. I think we need to travel these rivers again, and again, because there are so many beautiful things to be found at every level if we open ourselves up to them, even to the sexual things. Ross commented and him a kiss on the cheek from Anton, and an embrace, followed by a great big happy smile, as if he had just confirmed to her what she had always felt in her heart to be true, but had never had the courage to acknowledge. I never saw her smile that way, before, not to me, with a smile powered by such a great inner joy. Tony raised his hand at this point. I hate to spoil the party, he said, but I see Peter's dream in a different light. I see it, as a warning. But, as a warning it comes one year too late. If Peter's dream had occurred a year ago, and had been he did, the great tragedy, that the world has suffered might have been avoided. Our president didn't heed the gatekeeper's demands, but crashed the gate at every station, and made a mess of things that no one could untangle once the deed was done. He crashed the first gate by denying himself as a human being. He lied about his eligibility to stand for election as president. When he was challenged by concerned citizens, he used the force of the cohorts to conceal his birth certificate that would have shown, either directly or by concealment with the art of forgery, that he is not an American citizen by birth. The American birth citizenship is a constitutional requirement for a president. The would-be president denied the Constitution when he denied his identity. He crashed the draw gate. He denied the cohorts by using them for his obstruction of the truth. And he denied himself by denying the native truthfulness of a human being. He crashed through the first draw gate and made a mockery of the platform that our nation is founded on, which he thereby tore to shreds and smiled about it with his disgusting smile of utter contempt. The resulting damage is hard to repair. He denied so much of what is intrinsically good and beautiful and is designed to be enduring that he should be held accountable for the crime of besmirching the nation. He also crashed the second gate, Tony continued. As a candidate for election he promised the nation to protect its interest and uphold its principle. That was required of him as an oath. He crashed the gate of his oath of office by selling the nation down the river in the biggest bank heist in all history. That is generously known as the bailout swindle, designed to bail out the worldwide collapsing derivatives bubble, stealing $24 trillion from the nation to do it, settling the nation with a debt that can never be repaid. The bailout swindle would have collapsed had he not manned the phones personally, even before he became president, to force the congressional votes into line to approve the bailout swindle after it had already been rejected. That's crashing the gate. The president also crashed the third gate, Tony continued his analysis. He crashed the gate when he hired himself out as a puppy dog to the royal empire. In this capacity he became intensively involved in helping his masters in their vicious attempt to destroy the value of the American dollar, acting in effect as an enemy agent. He crashed through all the constitutional barriers that under decent circumstances would have protected the nation from this kind of abuse. Nor did he stop there. When the American Congress graciously passed a law that legalized what he had already done, but put a hundred billion cap onto his traitorous scheme, he added a signing statement to the bill saying that he feels not obliged to abide by the law of the Congress, but reserves himself the right, as dictator-in-chief, to do whatever he pleases in terms of throwing the nation's money into the colorts of empire by buying into its special drawing rights scam at any amount he fancies. His use of the signing statement to bypass the laws of the legislature, or to turn them upside down, is nothing short of crashing the protective gate of civilized society. And he crashed the fourth gate also, Tony continued. He is ramming the culture of empire down America's throat. He is forcing to reform the healthcare system onto a platform of euthanasia. 
That's the essence of his proposed Nazi-style healthcare reform bill. He is also forcing the global warming carbon cap hand trade bill unto an already dying nation to create an energy lean green economy powered by windmills in the shadow of destroyed industries. And while the states collapse into bankruptcy in the shadow of the wiped out industries, he sings his empire song, not a penny to the needy. Not a penny to help the states. Let the people die. If they are too poor to live, by all means, they should just die. He promises that his upcoming social security reform bill will go a long way towards this end, as his master's wish. Let's face it, the president has been a gate-crasher at heart from the word go, of the most vigorous kind, said Ross. Did we really think that such a man could be brought under adult supervision? Had he not demonstrated loud and clear that there exists no line? that one could draw that he would not cross, or a gate, that one could erect that he would not crash, or a barrier, that one could create to shield the nation with, that he would not bulldoze through. How did we think it to be possible to compromise with such a man, as a compromise on principle? It is not possible, is it, that a gate crasher of the, Mr. Devil, type can be magically reformed to become an, angel, or even partially. I think it was a grand delusion to assume that society could be protected in its critical period with a gate crasher in the house, said Sylvia. I think we should have been honest with ourselves that the survival of civilization could only have been assured with a complete change at the top of the house. Indeed, when America had voted for the man to become president, at least some did, the resulting vote had been a vote for the principle of complete change, uncompromising change, radical change, decisive change, and so on. This was the minimal that the day's critical situation had called for. When the survival of civilization is at stake one cannot compromise with a devil. What society voted for should have been delivered, said Anton. Even our Soviet leadership had known this to some degree. America didn't vote for a change in the intensity of the old crimes. It voted for a change that ends the betrayal. Since the president has demonstrated himself to be a gate-crasher, without the capacity for remorse, and one lacking the slightest sense of humanity, crashing through every safeguard of civilization, the man's removal should have been seen as the only option at the critical stage, before the house came down. This should have been done, if nothing less than to honor the spirit of the intention of the electorate. This should have been your task, and the task of all of us, everywhere. People say that the avenues did not exist to accomplish the essential task that we faced, said Fred. But is this a valid excuse when the task is to protect civilization? Even while the existing avenues were blocked, we should have moved. Other avenues should have been found to accomplish the vital task on which so much had depended, such as the survival of the nation and the world. I am certain that the U.S. Constitution contains some of these other avenues as under the principle of the common defense that we would have found if we had looked hard enough, which had merely not have come to the surface in our time. When the goal is clearly defined and its critical nature is recognized and acknowledged, the needed channels are bound to come to light, but not so when they are sought in the shadow of compromises, said Ross. A clear strategic defense was needed, as uncompromising. As are the constitutional principles themselves, and this should have been rich with asymmetric approaches, and new political principles, comparable to the new physical principles that LaRouche had called for in the SDI context. That's where we failed. What do you mean by, new political principles? I interjected. I meant new applications of existing principles, said Ross. Are you aware, for example, that a powerful process exists for defending the nation in situations, as we had before the crash, in which foreign agents had taken over the U.S. government and imposed policies of empire that were intentionally destructive to the USA, such as the policies that were pursued by our dear Nero president playing the role of a puppy dog on a short leash held by his handlers, the masters of the empire, centered in London. The American people have been in this type of situation before, during the colonial period, and have found a powerful way to defend themselves on a platform of natural law. 
they did it with the Declaration of Independence, that still applies, and remains the world's tallest declaration of the rights and duties of a people that are recognizing themselves as a nation with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, in fact it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security, and thus to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. This is a political principle that should have been recognized as a means for preventing the great catastrophe. The Declaration of Independence wisely states, Ross continued, that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have become accustomed. With the people of the USA, having suffered the object of empire for eight and a half years, which clearly evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, the people have earned their right to have a change in leadership effected towards a change in policy and a chance to reclaim the nation's character as a sovereign credit society standing in opposition to the monetarism of empire. The Declaration of Independence is a declaration of the right to call for change when a change is needed, and is also a declaration of the duty by society to implement the needed change. This deeply rooted call for change takes us to a process that exists deeply rooted in natural law, far more so than the process of impeachment that is easily blocked by traitors, and typically applies to much lighter cases of the nature of a misdemeanor, such as the case which had been engineered by entrapment against President Clinton. When greater crimes, deeper crimes, crimes that threaten the survival of the nation are the order of the day, more deeply rooted laws apply that are beyond the reach of being blocked by tactical political machinations. The American Declaration of Independence is a unique case of such a law in the world. And it is a law. It is the fundamental law on which the nation stands. The USA wouldn't exist without it. The Declaration of Independence is a law in hand beyond the reach of courts and princes to effect the needed change to save the nation when all other avenues have failed. It should have been applied. But my question to you, Peter, is, can you think of any way this law in hand can be implemented quickly and effectively in the rudimental domain when the legislative domain is blocked? The implementation of LaRouche's proposals that could have prevented the collapse of the world, like his Homeowner and Bank Protection Act, his Recovery Act of 2006, and the Great Lakes Renaissance Act were all held in limbo for reasons that the available avenues had failed. But the Founding Fathers evidently did not intend to keep the door open for such deep failures that block the future existence of the nation and the continuity of civilization. Under such circumstances, should an affront-line patriotic leader, like yourself, or even just a single citizen, who stands with the Declaration of Independence in his pocket, have been able to cause the arrest of the offending government officials, whether they be the president or congressman, or whatever, and declare a vacancy in their offices? The deeper the infractions go, and the more deeply rooted the law is that thereby applies, the more the authority to act falls upon the grassroots pioneers, because ultimately that is where the power rests, which is the power to say to the evils in high places, you cannot pass. So where were you, Peter, when this new political principle should have been implemented? Isn't that where every renaissance in history has risen from, from the self-activation of society at the grassroots level, encouraged by the leading geniuses of their time? So where were you? Where are you asleep like all of us? The Declaration of Independence is a declaration that authorizes change when all avenues have failed, Ross continued. Society's fear of empire and its induced love of its monetarism are the sources of mankind's enslavement, but through love for humanity and oneself as a human being, the misbased fear and false love can be put aside. 
these steps of progress out of slavery involve a profound declaration of principle that enables society to become the city upon a hill, the bastion of liberty, and for America the beacon of hope for mankind that America has been designed to be, with the power to act in such ways that the eyes of the world will be upon it, acknowledged for acts worthy of songs and inspiration, standing in defiance of empire, against terror, fascism, depopulation, genocide, euthanasia, etc. And against the globalized financial swindles that are wrecking the world, thereby becoming a leader in a world based on universal principles, principles that no one has made, and which all benefit from. This is what we should have been fighting for, but we didn't. We let the collapse occur. Do you think then that what I have said has merit? Said Tony to Ross. Or do you believe, as the president did then, that the Constitution, from which all authority flows for any U.S. institution of government to act, has become but an impotent drag, waiting for available space in the archives of museums? Since we don't believe this, can we assume then? that by the president's failing to transact the principles of the Constitution, and by his crashing the constitutional gates that protect society, the president had already lost his authority to act from the word go, as you say, which was then leaving the scene open to the much wider platform for society self-protection than is focused on traditionally as for cases of impeachment. We didn't explore the wider platform, such as the Declaration of Independence, that would have applied in this monumental case of crimes that destroyed the whole world, which wasn't just a misdemeanor where impeachment might have been applied. Tony turned to me your dream didn't indicate how society should have dealt with a gate crasher, he said to me what would the rational way have looked like in your dream to protect civilization from those escapees from the sewer that our world had been inundated with. I think the answer was indicated, I said. The gatekeeper's line has been, you cannot pass. Turn back. Of course if someone crashes through, it then becomes the task of everybody in the land to evict the intruder. The gatekeeper is just the first line of defense. After that it becomes everybody's task, because everybody's life is in danger. It is evidently impossible to dream about how this universal defense is carried out in detail, which is as wide with possibilities as are the seashores of the world. Here we face truly endless horizons. Life cannot be stereotyped into a small form, nor can the processes be stereotyped that are possible to protect it. We are human beings. We are living in a world of horizons without end. We live in a revolutionary world. A gate crasher is not a revolutionary, said Tony. A gate crasher destroys the natural defenses of civilization by walking all over them. He is one who trespasses on justice, honor, humanity, generosity, decency, economy, even life itself. Hitler was the prima donna of all the gate crashers, an arrogant, vain, temperamental, and conceited person, and worse than that, he was utterly evil, stupid, and a dancing fool, who had endeared himself to his masters in London. Hitler was a hater of mankind, as many today are, he was a gatecrasher. There wasn't a line drawn that he didn't cross, or a gate he didn't crash, or a barrier that he didn't plow through, and he shrieked with indignation at all who suggest that he was nuts, and had them killed. He demanded to be honored as a god, while wearing the face of the devil, and the people complied, bowing their heads out of fear, a gesture inducive to having their head chopped off. A revolutionary is not a gatecrasher, Fred interjected. He upholds honor, justice, humanity, love, and economy. That is what makes a revolutionary. He is one who is in tune with natural law, and fights for it, and lets the natural law of humanity remove whatever factors block its unfolding. He replaces the blocking factors with the universal principles that the barriers would prevent from coming to light. A true revolutionary is a builder, not an elephant crashing through the china shop. A revolutionary is a discoverer of the truth, not a dreamer up of lies. There is nothing revolutionary about lies, since lies are self-defeating. A revolutionary is a champion for justice, a healer in an unjust world where empire has outlawed justice. A revolutionary is a man of love, the bearer of the greatest power on earth, 
the bearer of the gift of science, culture, and the power of cognition, a creative and productive power. A revolutionary is a giant. The gate crasher is an empty shell, a shell so hollow inside that the wearer of the shell demands the world to drain its most precious substance into it, even everything it has, in faithful compliance. The gate crasher demands to be honored, even though he has no honor in his heart. The gate crasher is a conspicuously dishonorable person, unjust, with not a speck of humanity in his heart, and not a shred of decency, a person who wears the Adolf Hitler smile in public, and a swastika hidden under the shirt or blouse, and keeps a knife handy for those who foolishly support this person, that has forsworn its status as a human being. A revolutionary is one who exposes the hidden swastikas in all the courts of the world right up to the Supreme Court of the USA that has been well stocked with champions that stand proudly with gilded swastikas hidden in their heart. A revolutionary is one who understands natural law and says to the swastika bearers, even all of them, be gone. A revolutionary is one who sets up a court where honesty, justice, and love are the law, and who has access to this court of natural law, who has the courage to call this court into session, the court that convenes in the hearts of society. The future of society, therefore, whether it prospers or dies, is determined by how many revolutionaries it has among its ranks. Too many people have been circumcised and been taken prisoners by the enemy of society, but many still remain whole and remain human so that hope remains. Among them, we find the revolutionaries. If enough of them stand up to be counted as human beings, the age of the swastikas, worn hidden or openly, is over. Fred turned to me isn't this the question that each one of the gatekeepers in your dream had asked you? Said Fred in a serious tone. He asked you to look into your heart and determine your status as a revolutionary, as condition for allowing you to enter the domain of science. A revolutionary is a champion of science. He asked you if you have proven yourself to be such a person. Since you couldn't answer, he asked you to go back and discover yourself as a human being. Science doesn't come from the head, it comes from the heart, it doesn't flow from what the senses tell you about the world, but flows from the mind taking the senses to a higher level. The senses give you a hint, because what they perceive are but shadows of reality, which the mind opens up to you. That's where science begins. So, the gatekeeper asked you, are you primarily a sensuous creature, like an animal in the field, or are you a human being? A sensuous creature is often a gatecrasher, stealing for his satisfaction, or is demanding from others whatever it takes to satisfy its sensual rage, including committing rape and demand for adoration. This makes him a dangerous creature, because he lacks the depth of vision that comes from the mind. That is why the gatekeeper asked you, Peter, are you actively committed to your own scientific development? This is like asking you, if you are committed to classical music, poetry, and spiritual development. It appears he found you wanting on many counts. He also saw hope for you. He didn't see you as a crasher. Your dream about the rivers and the gates might have been occasioned by what you saw in the world in economic terms, interjected Tether. Nobody makes the grade anymore, and many have indeed become gatecrashers. That is why the world is thrown ever deeper into a collapse crisis. There is no scientific competence left. The collapse started already in the post-World War II period under President Harry Truman, the man who turned the Franklin Roosevelt world upside down, in which scientific development and humanity had played a major role. Truman, in contrast with Roosevelt, was a pathetic mouse who placed the USA onto the road of becoming a puppet of empire. Roosevelt's political legacy was fast fading in Washington, D.C., from the Truman time on, with Wall Street hacking away at it, hastening to rid the economy and the minds of the citizens of almost anything that reflected the scientific, creative, and productive spirit that had been the hallmark of the Franklin Roosevelt era. The result became devastating in the business arena. The new management of long-established firms were living essentially on the laurels of their predecessor, while denouncing the intellectual legacy that stood behind the laurels. Wall Street began eating up many respectable, 
privately held enterprises, setting the stage for the oncoming economic extinction of the nation that is now in its final stages. The heirs of the old management enjoyed pretending that they were demigods of entrepreneurial prowess, in reality they were pirates, living of the blood of their fading predecessors, who would have seen them with pity and disgust had they been able to foresee the new course. The heirs assumed that they carried the genes of past economic achievement, but lacking the substance that lies in the heart, they but tried to imitate what they couldn't understand or were no longer allowed to understand. President Kennedy attempted a revival with some brief successes, mobilizing the remaining residue of honest skills among management cadres, scientists, and leading technicians, but the system as a whole was already rotting by them, from the top down, and Kennedy was shot. The shot was directed against all who stood with the spirit of the Roosevelt era in their hearts. The sellout of America to the masters of empire, which had begun with the ugly years of the Truman presidency had taken a terrible spiritual, intellectual, and even moral toll. Now we face the challenge to rewind the entire parody that we call economics, said Fred. We need to rewind it past the acquisition swindles and the escalating financial frauds, past the stock market crash of 1987 past the loss of management power by clowns who became kings but had no idea of how the thing they had acquired actually ever worked. We face the challenge of bringing the world back to life with people at the helm that lack even the slightest conception of how to go about to bring the virtually dead economies of the world back to life, especially that of America. For this we need a qualitative change in the topmost positions right across the political and private economic leadership, rebuilding a quality that Franklin Roosevelt had embodied. But considering the depth of our present state of a deep collapse, and in addition, what more of it looms before us, we have to go back still further in time, all the way to Hamilton, who had pioneered the alternative to monetarism. That is where we need to start, creating a world without monetarism. That is a world without money, in the imperial sense, but with a special kind of money that exists in a credit society, a kind of money that is on a short leash and is directly tied to development projects that enrich the physical functioning of society and aid its spiritual, scientific, and technological development and increases its productive and creative power. LaRouche has tried to steer us into this direction for decades, said Heather, and practically hit us over the head with it back in 2006, when the auto industry started collapsing. LaRouche proposed at this time that the nation assign a portion of the floor space and personnel that was no longer required for automobile production to high-technology-driven programs of building up its basic scientific infrastructures and to engage in advanced industrial programs like mass-producing nuclear power complexes and high-speed rail transportation systems and also to manufacture the heavy components that are needed to replace the collapsing waterway infrastructures. But it was all sabotaged by a lot of swindlers in the international financier cabal. As the result the USA abandoned and destroyed its auto industry, scrapped its facilities, demolished its infrastructure, and put its once productive manpower on the growing pile of discarded people. In the shadow of this collapse under policies that are tantamount to treason, the USA was transformed into the wreck of the new century, under the direction of the London-centered monetarist agencies, which have sought to destroy our republic since it was born. It is not surprising then, that a year after the auto industry was demolished the great financial collapse began, since the financial values were increasing being recognized as being but empty shells. LaRouche warned in July of the next year, in 2007, that the immediate breakdown of the U.S. economy had begun, leading into a new world depression, portending a general, global economic breakdown crisis. That's the crisis under which the entire world is virtually dying today. He proposed some urgently needed action to rescue the remains of the U.S. chartered banking system through reorganization in bankruptcy, while at the same time placing the entire system of mortgage resident homeowners under a bankruptcy protection against foreclosures. His proposals would have saved the United States from all of the ruin that since came upon it but it was sabotaged by puppy dogs on the short leech latched to empire, puppy dogs that became train gate crashers. 
Now things are very grim, said Fred. We destroyed our industries, lost the services of our skilled workers, wrecked our currency by throwing $24 trillion in the bailout trough for those who destroyed us in the first place and are now plunging us and the entire world at an accelerating rate into a general global breakdown crisis which, unless it is stopped by competent measures, will mean the death of civilization and possibly the death of as many as billions of people as has been spelled out in the policies of the princes of empire who have proposed such ends in response to the alleged but non-existent global warming crisis that they have engineered for the purposes of genocide. The intended destruction of civilization globally is presently intended to occur during the unfolding global breakdown crisis. Adolf Hitler would be drooling in envy if he could see what is now in the works, with far too few aiming to stop the madness. He would smile at the new healthcare direction, our commitment to euthanasia, and our demonstrated commitment to burning our own food or to tax it to death with carbon legislation. We need something much more drastic now than a return to the Roosevelt platform to rescue civilization. Nothing short will do than the total replacement of the world's monetary system with a system that is based squarely on the Alexander Hamilton-style principle of the credit society that stood behind the American Declaration of Independence and our constitutional form of government afterwards that enshrined this principle into law. Thus today's need address cure requires much more than mere words on paper, it requires corresponding actions born from this principle coming to life in people's heart. You are asking for miracles, said Tony. No, I am only suggesting that we utilize what we have available, said Fred. I am suggesting that we use what we have within reach and use it as a remedy for the presently accelerating global general physical economic breakdown crisis in both our republic and in the world at large. The chance that society will do this may be slim, but it is a chance that we've got, and it is also the only chance that we now have left. LaRouche interprets this chance as being realized by two mutually indispensable general measures of reform that start with putting the entire U.S. financial system through global reorganization in bankruptcy, writing off the mass of financial trash which has been accumulated largely by fraud, and transferring the remaining assets consistent with the earlier Glass-Steagall standard from the accounts of a Federal Reserve monetary system into the Federal Constitutional Bank coupled with an absolute commitment to a credit system of our patriotic Hamiltonian constitutional tradition. Together with this, there must be a pioneering revolutionary action with a clear intention to bring the USA, together with Russia, China, India, and certain other keystone nations, into a new global credit system in order to replace every vestige of the incurably rotten existing world monetary system. LaRouche tells us that without writing off the pure financial trash that is encumbering the economies of the entire world today, no physical economic recovery of the planet is possible, or even a chance to stop the presently ongoing collapse into a planetary new dark age. Isn't this corresponding to actions born from the founding principle of the nation coming to life in people's heart?